ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being on our program. Why are we here today? We're here to talk about the metaverse, metaverse, metaverse. It's a term that you're hearing more and more. This is the middle of summer 2022. And over the last three months, I've been seeing it. I've been inundated with it because I see it in the journals, magazines, whether it be uh, newspapers, Wall Street Journal, MIT Review. And now it's starting down where I'm watching a baseball game and I've got a commercial on the metaverse and all of a sudden it's popping up everywhere. And I scratch my head and I think there's, it's gotta be more than a coincidence that I'm hearing about it from so many directions, but I have not been able to understand it, I, but I feel it's important. I think there's something significant going on. I don't think this is just science fiction or something that's going to come fan come by and pass us up in a few days or so. I think it's something that is really fundamentally changing our world, changing ourselves, changing our communication. But these are my guesses. Let's go to an expert. Let's find out what this information is. Let's try to tap that information. And we're going to have some fun. He's going to do some things with us. He's going to show us a little bit of what the uh, metaverse can do and uh, I've been looking at it, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. Dr. Scott Walker, he is, his background is he's from a family of the military. So that means he's traveled everywhere in the United States, jumped around as his family members, his mom and dad, and keep getting transferred to new places. And they call them military rats because they just keep moving around. So, but that can be also a wonderful education as well. And we bring him up to the level where he went to UC Riverside and he did organic chemistry. So here we have someone in the high-end chemical world analysis and now working in IT. So that's a very interesting combination. And one of the questions I'd like to ask him during the show is that that information that he learned in biology transfer over to IT. So with that, thank you very much for being on the show, Dr. Scott Walker. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez, glad to have uh, to be here. Well, uh, let's jump in right after the fact. You know, uh, A, what is the metaverse? And B, is this something uh, just going to be here today and it'll be gone tomorrow? So uh, we'll answer those questions kind of in reverse order. So will it be here today? Will it be gone tomorrow? The answer is it will be here today and it will be here tomorrow. And then what is the metaverse? Uh, very simply, if someone asked, it's a, the three-dimensional experience of the internet. So if we can, for those of us who are old enough, if we remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, we had this uh, communication uh, medium where we could chat over what at that time was the very nascent uh, internet where you can do uh, little words of text. And uh, at that time, that was all that you could see where on one screen, someone would type a sentence and it would appear on someone else's screen in, a, in another area. Fast forward into maybe the mid to late 90s, and once the advent of Google and Yahoo came along, uh, we started transferring single sentences into whole pages. It then became from one-dimensional lines of text into two-dimensional. Fast forward now 20 years later, and we're now into, we want to make it into a three-dimensional experience, and we want to immerse uh, people in terms of their experiences into something they can uh, see and hear. And of course, we want to involve as many of the senses as possible, but as of right now, it's going to be a, a an audio and a visual type of experience. So of course so, we want to go ahead. So right now are we two dimensional? For the most part, we are two dimensional. For the for the for a very small uh, segment of society that has been able to afford the hardware and it avails themselves to the bandwidth that allows them to have the three dimensional experience uh, using uh, virtual reality and augmented reality equipment. Um, yeah, it's it's mostly two dimensional for most of us right now. Uh, but the bigger companies, the Facebooks, uh, you know, uh, companies like the, the Oracles and the Googles and the Microsofts are moving forward with making that two-dimensional experience into a three-dimensional experience. Okay, so sort of trying to remind myself a little bit of the, this whole perspective of dimensions. So three-dimensional is when I turn around and I see something to my left, to my right in my room, I, I can see the dimensions, I can see uh, far and near and I'm walking through my room. I'm walking through a three-dimensional environment. So what you're saying, if I understand it correctly, I'll be able to do that over the internet? That is correct. And not necessarily actually having to walk. You could be you know, sitting in your chair. Uh, it could be uh, you, know, you yourself can be motionless while you 
have uh, you know a device that you're using either you know on your head or you're wearing it in the form of uh, augmented reality glasses, um, where the experience around you is presented to you in a three-dimensional fashion. And that is true. You can look left, right, back, front, up, down, um, and you would be able to see things uh, represented three-dimensionally in a digital fashion, so that as you go forward, you can make choices in a much more rapid fashion than you would if you were just looking at a two-dimensional web page in front of you on a computer. Okay, let me, again, let me sort of try to catch up with this. So I'm here and through some apparatus, I keep hearing about lenses over your head, over your eyes. Now all of a sudden that takes me over to Venice, Rome, Venice, Venice, Italy. And now I can walk down St. Mark's Square. And that would be correct. Hear and feel being there. You so as of right now, the only two senses that we have been able to kind of uh, harness is basically audio and visual. Uh, the olfactory sense, being able to smell, gustatory, taste, and touch, tactile has not yet been put into place, uh, you know, as something that would be widely available for commercial use. But right now, it's the it's the seeing and the hearing of the experience that, like you said, walking down uh, St. Mark's Square, say, you know, experience it live using something like Google Earth, where you can look around and all you know, 360 degrees and, and feel like you're there. You'd hear it and you'd see it. And they wouldn't necessarily feel it or taste it or, you know, smell it. Um, that might be uh, something a little bit more uh, in the future that we can get to. But as of right now, it's only two senses. So if I'm watching a, I'm watching a show and I'm watching Walking Down Mark Square on my TV, that's two-dimensional. Three-dimensional, I, I feel like I'm there. You would see, you would feel like you're there. Exactly. So if you had a device that, that you could put on that would allow you to turn your head in whatever uh, direction you wanted, up, down, left, right, back, front. And yes, you could see all around you as if you were there. And that is, uh, that's the idea, which is to give you that experience that if you could not actually be there in person, you could experience it virtually. Is this, for example, would this discourage me to ever go there? Since I'm saying, been there, done that, I did it over my virtual system. Not at all. Actually, I think it's quite the opposite. It would actually impel you to want to go there. So in cases where people don't have those experiences or wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to see what it's really like, I think this would do quite the opposite. This would actually um, you know, cause people to want to experience that for themselves for real. But it's like one of those things, anytime you want to go someplace, you might want to find out a little bit before you go there. You can read about it. You can ask friends or you could put a three-dimensional uh, augmented reality or virtual reality device you know, on, on your person and then experience it, you know, at least virtually from either a scene, visual, or an audio hearing standpoint. Okay, so Dr. Walker and myself, we want to go to Mark Square. And can we go together? We can Your, go together. Through your computer, mine through mine? That is correct. You can go together, and you, we, we could both have devices on, and then we could be in separate places like we are right now. Um, and we could go and experience uh, that particular place together virtually, um, next to each other at that same location and at that same time. So this can be done now? That's correct. It can be done right now. Okay, so why are we doing this interview two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional? So a lot of it comes to the democratic uh, availability of the technology or the devices that we would both have to have for it to be possible. So uh, when, when virtual reality first came on the market probably about 10 years ago, it was pretty much uh, something that you had to have a lot of money to do. It was in the you know five to ten thousand dollar range. Um, now it's become a lot more democratic, where you have something like you know that you can buy for around three hundred dollars. Um, you can use it, and now you could experience it. And so long as you have an internet connection that's you know fairly fast, um, you can then go to those different places uh, together and experience it. But again, it, it, it requires money. You have to pay for the devices to allow you to do that, and that may not be something that's available to everyone. So what you're saying, what I'm understanding is if I can spend the $300 for the uh, lens to put over myself and I have supposedly 5G internet, I could do it right now? That is correct. You could do it right now. Wow. So, well, would I need more services, i.e. would I need to pay Google or pay Apple or pay so, someone to, so, do, to access this one? So Google, Google had a free app, uh, and I say had, it, it, I don't know if it's still active right now, called Expeditions, that is easily downloadable to a phone. 
and uh, the phone can be set at a set distance from your eyes using a uh, kind of a cardboard uh, box oh, eyeglass that. setup. Yeah, is, you slide it into a cardboard that went over your eyes. That is correct. And, oh, and the, the application is free was, or was free. You know, I don't know if they're, they're still using it at this time, but it would allow entire classrooms of, of students to go with a teacher who would take them to various points in, in the world, and they could experience that location all at the same time. And it could be controlled by an educator uh, to be able to demonstrate, like, say, the Eiffel Tower or Machu Picchu or the Aztecs, you know, uh, you know the, the, the types of structures they have in, in, in Mexico. Um, and you could, you know, have a virtual trip uh, where everybody who was using that particular app on their phone that had the particular cardboard box eyeglass device set up uh, could experience it. So, um, and that's been around for about five, six years. Um, and, and that didn't cost anything so long as you had a, a phone that was capable of, of being able to run the, the app, uh, had to have enough, you know, uh, processing power that you could do it. The, okay, so let's say I go to Teotihuacan and I'm gonna see the pyramids you know, outside of Mexico City, and I'm gonna walk down there. Is this a program that is somewhere housed in some warehouse somewhere, and I'm looking at that program, or am I actually there? You're looking at what someone else has generated before you. So it would require that uh, it's not like it's um, real time per se. Okay. Unless you had someone who was actually there and had a 360 degree camera that was say on top of their head as they're walking around that was transmitting live. But yeah, most of the uh, areas that are that you would walk through and experience have been pre-recorded, um, but they allow you to look in 360 degrees in all different directions. Much the same as if you were to look at uh, Google Maps and you were to go down the street and anyone who's used that particular application, if you're looking at streets, street signs, street corners, and you were to click on it, it can take you to that particular street corner. You can see it two-dimensionally on a screen, but you can also see it virtually if you were to put on a, a, you know, a virtual reality device and it would feel like you're on that street corner. You could look around, but it's static. It's not, uh, it's not in motion. Um, it's something that's been pre-recorded. There are videos that you can see, say, for example, on YouTube, um, that are also three-dimensional, where you actually have a uh, a video that is being shot also in 360. But again, it's 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 been recorded. It's not something that's live. Um, there are instances where you have live transmission of a video, and uh, you can actually go and you know uh, put a AR augmented reality or a virtual reality device and experience what it would be like as if you were actually there. But those examples are are, are not as common. So. I can be at the concert. I can look around to the people around me. That is correct. Actually, it's, it's good they actually brought that point. Uh, various raves will do exactly that. They'll use a 360 uh, camera device and they will transmit live. And anyone who has, uh, uh, say, a virtual reality device can, can put it on and, and experience it, much the same as like pay per view, so to speak, would be for, say, sports, um, but similar, similar experience. And that would be a live experience because you're experiencing it as it's being transmitted live. And so, uh, but it's not something, uh, it, it's not as prevalent unless people kind of organize ahead of time to know that that was available. Um, the metaverse, of course, would be addressing something where that would be a norm. So we're not quite there yet uh, because it, it, of course, there's just a lot of bandwidth and there's a lot of uh, technology and devices that need to be in place for everyone to be able to kind of put something onto their head very quickly so they can experience something live, so to speak. It'd be the same as, say, being at the Super Bowl and you're actually there, you're at front row seats. Um, the NFL, I'm sure, would charge a certain fee for that particular experience. Or, <laughs> a, a little bit of money, I'm sure. Right, right. <laughs> at, ringside at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, you know, at a primary boxing match, you know, same thing. Um, but then you would actually get the experience of actually being right there. You'd hear it, you'd see it. Um, and it'd, be, it'd probably be a kind of a pay-per-view service. And that's, you know, one of the things that you could, you know, experience as if you were right there. Did this whole system... You know, and I'm packaging a great number of pieces into one area when I say a system. Was all this system created first in the military? And then now it's starting to get into part into the public market? I, I couldn't really comment on that if that's really true or not, but I, I wouldn't put it past uh, organizations like DARPA having probably have developed this probably 20, 30 years ago. I, I highly doubt that this technology from an idea standpoint is anything new. This is, you know, you know, Star Trek back in the days of the 60s had been around. If, if we could imagine it, we can dream it's probably been there. Um, but of course, most, a lot of things do start in the defense sector and then kind of permeate into the commercial world right. 30, 40 years later, once it doesn't become a, a disadvantage for it to be out to the public. 
but I, I, I'm just, I'm just uh, surmising. I wouldn't know sure, for sure. Sure. Obviously, the GPS being one of those systems, and probably even the internet, but that's a whole different issue. What's the impact? Okay, let's assume for a moment. Let me fast forward. Let's assume for the moment that everyone can go into the metaverse. There's enough bandwidth for everyone to go on. Everybody, majority of the people have the technology to access it. How would that change us? How would that change society? So let me give you some examples. So right now you're looking at a background that I have. It's kind of like a maybe a standardized background uh, that I just kind of pulled off the internet. It kind of gives a, the idea that one, you have to be wearing a device, which you see this, 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 uh, uh, you know, this character right here that has the device in the head. This is a uh, augmented, uh, excuse me, it is a virtual reality device. Augmented reality would mean it superimposes um, other digital representations over what you really see. You'd have to have some kind of a device like this. Um, but as far as how it would change, okay, so if, if I just change a couple of my backgrounds so that you can kind of see, here's a background. This is a, a Facebook background. And if I just move off a little bit off to the side here, you'll see that the idea is, is that you have these little pictures of these people, which we call avatars, uh, representations of the uh, people in the real world that we've chosen. And you'll see that they're looking at what looks to be floating types of screens where they can make choices. And those choices would then lend themselves to uh, going to say different uh, websites in a virtual world. If I change the background yet again, is to say something that can actually be used um, uh, technology wise. Let me give you this example. Let me move off to the side here. So here we have an example of a, of a person who's looking at, I say a prototype piece that needs to be put into place for uh, you know, this particular uh, motor or device. And if they needed to have it custom made before it actually was made, um, you know, a company could uh, show real time to the person that needs a particular type of component manufactured. This is how it would look. Would this be appropriate for that person's need? That person could then respond uh, in the affirmative or negative real time. And then uh, an order can be placed. And this could be, he could be talking to someone over, you know, across the other side of the world. And so from a manufacturing standpoint, uh, it's, it's going to be huge. And when they're doing any kind of R&D or testing, again, if you have someone here who's doing uh, testing of particular uh, types of devices and they need to see if something could possibly fit into a particular area before actually ordering the part, again, this is going to be huge because they can manipulate things that have yet to be constructed without having to, it would be cost more cost effective uh, rather than having to do trial and error. So that those, those are some of the areas, say, for example, in, in engineering. Um, but fast forward to like what we actually do have today. If we look at um, things like this, we'll have a lot of uh, video conferencing. So again, uh, a, a lot of representations like this have been made in Hollywood movies, well, where you could be wearing what on, on this particular gentleman's head uh, is what we call an augmented reality device where uh, he's actually in that particular room, but he's actually able to see digital representations of other people that he's having conversations with. And in some cases, the conversation is with uh, a digitized version of another person. In other cases, it may be a cartoon or an avatar version of another person. But the idea is, is that if you have all these different people at different parts of the world, you need to have a conference uh, where you can see gestures, articulations, intonations of people. You wouldn't be able to do that over a phone. You probably wouldn't even be able to do that necessarily over a web conference like, like what we're doing right now. Um, but if someone's making motions with their hands and arms, these are the types of things they can see the body language of say the person who's kind of there up against the wall with his arms crossed and he has his, his knee bent. I mean, that, that without saying anything, you kind of get an idea of what that person's affect is with what it goes. So that's the power of it. You're starting to get a lot more information um, that you could use in the metaverse that would not otherwise be possible uh, with two dimensional internet. And then still even further, if we were to take it further into say something like this, where we're using it in medicine. So again, this is a little bit graphic, but this is a shoulder reconstruction um, uh, physicians that are actually doing a, uh, you know, kind of a shoulder reconstruction can actually see where things are inside of the particular joint without actually having to cut it open to look at it. So when they're manipulating and they're doing replacements, they can do so with minimal, minimally in, uh, invasive procedures. And so healing time is a lot quicker, recovery is a lot quicker. And these are things that are in place as of right now. Um, fast forward into areas like education, which is kind of like where uh, I'm involved, you'll see things like this, where if you have a student and they, you want to show them how, say, for example, the gears of a transmission work, um, they can manipulate and, and move things around uh, in three-dimensional space. Again, they're wearing that virtual reality headset. Uh, these are that $300 device I was talking about that you can uh, acquire right now. 
and they would be able to do things that would otherwise either be too dangerous or too expensive to be able to do um, if they were there in person. So uh, you can start addressing learning issues and, and student learning and student achievement uh, uh, goals much earlier in life than say something that would be taken on at the college level. Just the whole idea of being able to visualize it and manipulate it, you know, maybe fourth graders, my gosh, you know, it gives them the whole concept of what a transmission is. I mean, giving them a mechanical background and right. making them aware that the exposure is unprecedented. Correct. And if they were talking, they were having that same, uh, again, this is a, a, a review where you're, you're talking with the chemistry teacher, they're showing you uh, something on the, uh, on the page, and then the actual chemical structures pop out. And so real time, as that teacher is talking remotely to say a student uh, who either couldn't come to school because they were sick, or for example, if they're having to talk with someone who's across the world where uh, they don't have teachers in a particular content area, they would not only be able to show you the book that they were in front of, but they could actually have things pop out so that, you know, again, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so from the standpoint of being able to deliver a, and address a particular educational standard, it's going to be done much more easily in this fashion. Not yet possible, um, except in very limited instances in the two-dimensional web page world. Wow. Question. Um, so I have... 5,000 students across the world attending a class at Harvard in uh, organic chemistry. Could they all attend simultaneously and all of them uh, be there through the metaverse? That is correct. That, that is exactly what they could do. They could, yeah. So this, this makes um, education and experiences in general more democratic, uh, where people who would otherwise not have the ability to be present uh, with other people uh, in, in, in a way that would not be possible because they are geographically too far away right. or maybe because schedules don't coincide or if you're wanting to experience and have a, an expert in their field deliver a particular lecture where you have, say, you know, 10,000 people, you could not fit all those people in one classroom. Mm -hmm. But in the metaverse, everyone can be in that classroom and everyone can be up close as if you're talking straight with a particular, uh, you know, educator or professor who's, who's giving the, the lecture. Wow, everyone's sitting in the front row. That is correct, that is correct. And that's the power, that, that would be the power of the metaverse because you could actually three-dimensionally experience that, you know, that, that type of uh, seeing and hearing type of experience that you maybe otherwise not been able to do. Not the many learning, of us get to. The learning curve would hopefully be. It. I mean, I mean, right. I don't, I, I mean, it, I just see it straight up. It would, yeah, it would actually be a lot more shallow. People could get those learning experiences a lot quicker um, than they would if they had to uh, not have that experience, you know, you know, if they had to do it on their own. Okay, you're working for a school district in the Los Angeles area, second largest district in, there. Um, is this system being implemented in all the classrooms? And I don't think it's specifically my question to this district but as a whole, are districts already implementing the system of the- uh, I wouldn't say a lot of districts are, but the districts are starting to. So being able to use uh, virtual reality in the classroom to promote student learning and student achievement is starting to take hold and take foot. And the biggest reason is to promote student engagement. Uh, one of the hardest issues is to uh, assist the teacher in being able to drive learning. Um, any teacher will tell you, at least in this day and age, that, that they're fighting with the ultimate uh, competitor, which is the cell phone. Uh, cell phones, uh, the little computers that the students have their hand, uh, usually compete for the student's attention. And so the only way you're going to be able to win that battle and, and be able to focus on the learning is to give them an experience that outdoes, again, a two-dimensional experience. As of right now, uh, cell phones are fairly two-dimensional. You're an expert in this area, and there is an effort to get this in place, what are the obstacles that school districts face to make this system be integrated into their educational lesson plans? Okay, so obviously uh, cost for the devices is one, okay? But assuming cost is able to be, the concern with minors, of course, is, uh, is, is student privacy. You know, these are minors. And so the types of content that they would be um, exposed to would have to be controlled, which it already is right now, for the most part. Um, but then the other thing, of course, that no one likes to bring up or seems to mention is the, the concept of nausea. Um, not everyone can handle a 
device put on their head um, and, and come away from that experience that doesn't make them nauseous. Um, so unfortunately for some people, it's, it's second nature. It's not a big deal. For other people, they can't handle um, you know, being put into a virtual reality environment without feeling sick to their stomach because of the motion sickness that, that causes some people. So um, as much as we would like to put one of these devices in front of every student, we don't know what the um, return is going to be if half of our students can't handle it. And we have teachers that can't handle it. Um, so, so <laughs> I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> right, right, right. So if we're all using it and they all become nauseous, then learning can't happen. And so that that's kind of an that's kind of a consideration. So this all presumes that no one gets nauseous. You put it on, everyone ex, you know ex experiences it and enjoys uh, the presentation much as the same as you would go to a theater. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, that that is a that is an issue that still needs to be worked out um, because uh, anytime people are put into a uh, three-dimensional virtual environment um, frame of reference in terms of the ability of people to kind of maintain it without getting nauseous, that's an issue that still has to be worked out. Is this, is this something new or is just from the beginning when they started doing this whole apparatus, some people just were experienced the ability to not be able to see it? Yeah, it, it's, it, it's just like anyone who drives in a car or any kind of a uh, you know, vehicle that's moving or like that's on a boat and you get seasick. Um, anytime the, usually it, it's like probably, I would say 50, 50, you know, 50% of people don't get seasick and they're perfectly fine. And other people they're, they're hanging over the side and they're having to do their business. Um, it's the same thing. And it, usually when you put people in the driver's seat, so to speak, uh, and they have control of their frame of reference, then their body movements subconsciously can be anticipated and they don't get motion sickness. Um, but the, the main thing here is that we're really going to make it democratic and we're really going to make it so that this is kind of like widely used. Um, the current three-dimensional virtual reality devices have that inherent problem. We're hoping with augmented reality, uh, like, you know, lens devices that uh, allow you to look through, but see digital representations being put onto and superimposed upon real frames of reference, which is like, say, the classroom, that that would decrease, um, you know, the motion sickness or the nausea component. Um, and that's where a lot of the research and R&D is being done right now by all the bigger companies, because they understand this, they know this, and they know that if people uh, are getting sick and they can't focus on what's being presented, you can't enjoy the experience, you can't listen, you can't learn, you can't watch, you can't do anything. The first thing that people want to do is take it off of them, never put it back on. And so uh, I think that the bigger companies, they, they're, they're aware of this and they're working on it. Um, you know, they have family and some friends, just like the rest of us that experience these kind of things. And so it, that's one of the Things that has nothing to do with the technology uh, end of things. It just has to do with uh, being able to kind of take into account the human component. You know, looking into the future is always very tricky and no one has a crystal ball and there's nothing 100% absolutely in the future. But do you see this system taking over most of the educational classrooms, given if they find a way to solve this whole idea of getting sick? Uh, five, 10, 20 years, uh, most of the classrooms will be? I, I, would, I, would, I, would say, I would say 10 years would probably be, uh, the, maybe it might could happen sooner, but I would say 10 years would be, 10 years from now, if we're hitting 2030, for example, 2030, 2035, I, I would say that this would probably be a foregone conclusion where using augmented reality or virtual reality devices uh, or something close to it uh, would be something that, that we would use like telephones, um, it'd be democratic, it'd be widely available, they'd be cheap enough. Um, but again, uh, if the, and that's assuming that the nauseousness uh, concern is, 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 is taken care of. One of the solutions to that, uh, if, if for those that are fortunate enough to say gone to Disneyland, and they've been on the people mover, uh, they go into these, they go into this particular uh, ride where you're sitting in it and you're going through these big rooms that have these projectors that project 360 degrees onto the wall. And so you're not wearing anything on your head uh, but as you were moving through the, this, this uh, kind of a train track, uh, you know, ride, and you're going through these different rooms that have, uh, you know, 3D projectors that are, you know, projecting all different areas on the wall, because you're not wearing something on your head, and your frame of reference is where you're sitting, um, that's one solution. But to do that, that means you'd have to have, say, uh, projectors that, you know, project on all different sides of a classroom, and the classroom would have to be built specifically for it. Um, mm. But then you wouldn't have to wear anything on your head. The experience by the students would all be the same uh, if they're watching that as a as the educator is presenting it. Um, not that you don't get motion sickness in those environments, you do, 
um, but it's a lot less because uh, your experience is the same as everyone else's. It's much the same as if you were sitting on a bus or in a car, you're looking out the window. Um, again, people do get motion sickness just riding in a car, right? You know, they're looking out the same window as you are. They get sick, you don't. Um, so again, uh, there's always going to be that segment of the population that's going to have that issue um, until they work it out, you know. I, I had totally forgotten that in Disneyland many years ago, they had a round room. You stood in the middle, everybody just stood. And then, you know, like you say, it was 360. And I remember that position where it was on the plane and it would go sideways and people would grab onto the railing. I'd forgotten that. And I guess I should have connected that, that this really the issue today that you just visually see motion that's really not there, but your mind thinks it's there. Correct, correct. And, uh -huh. and again, if you're trying to learn something or discuss something, and that's going on. If it doesn't bother you, you take it as a as a nice experience. That's great, um, you know. But you're going to lose half the you know half the room if if they can't handle it. And so again, and most people, as soon as they experience that, they want that to stop immediately. And it doesn't matter how fantastic the experience is. The first thing you want to do is just get out of that environment. And so absolutely, absolutely. For the educational classroom, I could see its benefit, and we're not talking about K through 12. We're talking, you know, medical schools, et cetera. Outside of that, in manufacturing, I can see that as well. Is there another area where it's being used that people usually don't discuss or realize that that's having an impact on that? Um, I there's probably many different instances that can be used. I, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, uh, you know, off the top of my head right now, I'm not thinking of anything. Right, you know. right. But basically, uh, it can be used anything from, you name it, politics to uh, any types of uh, meeting presentation that's going on in the world. If, if people wanted to have the front row seat at the G7 summit, you could see the, the world leaders right up close as if they were right there. Um, and so the, the applications are, are, are boundless. Um, but again, it, it requires that you have the necessary infrastructure to support it. And that's just getting in place right now. So you can think of it much akin to like how they're starting to do with the electric vehicles, which started about 10 years ago. You had to have a lot of the infrastructure to be put in place. We're, you know, 10 years ahead. Um, now electric vehicles, you know, are on the roads. Uh, but, you know, we still have to get more infrastructure out there so that it becomes common. Um, and, and so that if you use that as a paradigm, uh, it took a decade just to even get to the point where, again, not everyone has that type of technology, but, you know, I, you know, we see them on the road right now, you know, in 2022, back in 2010, not many people were driving around electric cars, 12 years ahead, we do see it. So you figure another 12 years ahead from now, um, you know, in the 2030s, uh, you know, these augmented reality and virtual reality devices uh, may be in place and they may be very common. They're very democratic. They're easy to use um, and they don't cause those types of uh, nauseousness and, you know, motion sickness that's in, uh, inherent right now in the design. My final question, do you see any reason of concern of this system being put in place in the public's hand? Uh, no, I, I don't. I, I think this is just like a telephone. Um, it, it, you know, uh, it, let's, let's go back and let's, let's ask the kind of corollary question. When cell phones first came out kind of like in the mid nineties, we could have asked the same question. Do we see a concern with the relative ease with which people will be able to communicate with these very strong, powerful devices that in the future you're going to be able to communicate. Uh, it's going to geolocate you. Um, anyone can find you. And all these properties are now inherent in our cell phones. I mean, um, we carry them voluntarily. Um, so this is just another piece of technology that uh, we'll go for it. We'll use it. Um, and like anything else, uh, you know, it'll have its use in place. I don't think there's something to be afraid of or anything. I think this is just going to be another tool that's just going to make it easier for people to communicate and, and make those types of connections, whether it be commercial educational or you know for defense or for government you feel you understand it you work with it on a daily basis but on a personal level i mean i i get already the feeling that you're very excited about it on a personal level are you happy to see the system and are you looking forward to seeing it implemented everywhere I, I am looking forward to seeing it uh and as far as its implementation that's going to be up to you know, the different segments of society that want to use it. But I, I really do think that, uh, you know, it's going to make communication uh, a lot easier. So uh, let me give you a, a random example. If we're going to put people in, in, on Mars in the next 20, 25 years, um, most of the time that everyone says right now, it's a one-way trip. So you're, you're not going to have these, these individuals who are going to be on that particular planet that are going to be able to converse 
with people who are families back here unless you have some sort of way to meaningfully uh, have that experience. Well, you have the metaverse. Um, you could have that person who's walking around in the room, much as again as Hollywood is depicted, um, and then they could have that experience as if they were kind of pseudo there. I mean, we know that, that it's a digital representation, uh, but at the same time too, uh, I think it's gonna be very powerful uh, to be able to bring people together that maybe cannot be together. Uh, we had this thing called a pandemic, COVID, and so many families uh, were separated just for the mere reason that you had to stay separated to remain safe. Well, if you had a family gathering and uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so or grandma so-and-so couldn't be there, well, with the metaverse, you could. You could have that representation. Um, and again, that type of uh, bringing people together who could not otherwise be together would be great. We're going to look at it from a commercial standpoint. Um, not everyone gets a chance to know what it looks like inside of a Rolls Royce uh, showroom. Maybe you want to see it. You know, maybe uh, you you want to see the what it what it what it's you know what it's like to to see the insides of these types of vehicles. Um, if they wanted to sell products that you could not otherwise uh, get to because maybe they're they they've sold out, um, you could see it firsthand and uh, experience it for yourself because you had someone who was there who was wearing say a camera a three D camera on top of their head, and then you could see what it's like when they unveil it. Again, so from a commercial standpoint, from a you know, a meeting standpoint, a family standpoint, a communication standpoint. I think it's, like I said, it's going to be what the telephone did for uh, us back at the turn of the last century. This will be the same thing as what we'll probably do for it this century. It sounds like it's going to be a radical change. I don't mean that negatively or positively. I'm trying to be, you know, in the middle of just learning about it, but it will alter the way we do things. And I think you said it from the beginning, um, if I'm walking down uh, St. Mars Square in Venice, then I want to go there and I want to see it really actually, is it the way I'm seeing it through my goggles? Yeah. Correct, correct. It, it's something I think that will give, uh, it, it'll give incentive for people to actually go in and experience it for real. So it, it, it by no means is a replacement, but it will, if I, I, if I think this is the way it's going to go, it's going to incentivize people to have those real experiences but you can't really have those real experiences if you don't know where you're going to in the first place. You know, you have to have some kind of frame of reference, like why am I going to travel to Europe to, to take a vacation or South America or Asia or Europe? Uh, it'd be nice to know, okay, where are we going? What is it going to look like? What is it going to be like? And the metaverse would be able to provide that experience ahead of time. You do your research. And then of course you go and experience it for real when you have that opportunity. Amazing. Amazing. Dr. Walker, I'm, I'm, pretty much finished with my questions for today I you know I've got 10,000 more to go through but you know for today it's just we're running out of time but uh, I'd like to um, bring the show to an end and give you your final words uh, closing statement so again uh, for why we started this conversation which is what is the metaverse again that three-dimensional uh, representation of what the internet is to become right now it's pretty much two-dimensional uh, and the idea is, is that it's going to provide uh, additional opportunities in the future for people to communicate. It's gonna be an enhancement to what we already have, um, but it's not gonna be put into place in a meaningful fashion until the infrastructure has been put into place, which a lot of the companies out there are spending billions of dollars in doing. So I would see this as something that's uh, kind of a given maybe in about a decade. Well, thank you for your work to trying to bring this system into the classroom now and having the students uh, engage and use it and understand its ability to be utilitarian uh, as they moving up into the ladder of into the working world and this can give them exposure to many fields and get up close and personal where before it was just all theoretical and there's just words on a on a piece of paper but now they can actually be there and see it um, i the picture i get in my head was the time when I saw the one of the space shuttles launch out of Cape Canaveral, uh, Cape Kennedy back then, and what a moving experience that was. So I could imagine that all of a sudden the classroom can transport themselves and actually see a launch. I mean, it was just uh, puts shivers down your spine and just thinking of how wonderful it is and it can be inspirational and you're opening the door. So I applaud what you're doing. Thank you very much for being on the show, Dr. Scott Walker. Thank you for having me. Thank you.